Okay, we're recording now. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Alan Sherman, uh, the director of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. And today it's our honor to have Jason Reinhardt from Sandia National Laboratory speaking to us on um, risks in cybersecurity. Um, following this talk, we have two more uh, CDL talks lined up for the fall. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back for those. Um, thank you so much, Jason, for, for coming to us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, should I go ahead and launch in? Go ahead. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm, uh, I teach risk analysis in various capacities and, um, I've been part of risk analysis in lots of different, uh, uh, governments, uh, efforts and private efforts, private industry efforts. Um, I'll start here by saying that um, all of my comments today are my own, I'm not speaking on behalf of Sandia or DOE uh, or the NNSA or, or the Galactic Federation or the U.S. government or whatever. So um, I'm going to be speaking, I'm going to be giving you my views about why risk analysis is hard and why we fail at it so often um, and introducing some formalities that are pretty common in the field of risk analysis. So if you've done risk analysis in the past, you've probably seen bits and pieces of this. Um, and doing that with sort of the, the intent that um, formalism matters. Uh, and I see, I've been involved in a lot of risk analyses that have been focused on cyber systems specifically um, uh, as they pertain to the critical infrastructure and things like that. Um, and there's at least three big confounds that make this difficult to do in, um, in, the, in cyber specific problems. And so I'll talk about each of those and, and a couple of cases talk about what we try to do to overcome those. Um, and so with that, I'll jump in. I'm happy to take questions as we go or at the end, however, whatever works for people. Uh, but if something's not clear as I'm talking about it, then please stop me and, and make sure that I clarify it. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, make the assumption that I'm, I'm being as clear as I could be, so. So I'll start with, um, why is it so difficult to do good risk analysis? I see a lot of bad practice. I see a lot of bad risk analysis that um, leads to weird results or, uh, or cases where um, the results don't seem to actually drive anything in terms of change. And um, there's lots of pathologies here. Um, the first is that we lack common definitions and so um, and frameworks for thinking about uh, risk. Um, even the Society for Risk Analysis, the professional organization uh, for folks who do what I do, um, they tend to quibble and argue about different definitions, or rightfully so, they should be, right? I mean, we need to get these things clear. Um, but there's, it's not like there's um, a really clearly accepted definition for all of the terms that we think about. Uh, and so that makes it hard to talk about, right? The, it's hard to communicate about what we mean by risk and how do we think about risk. Um, Another big uh, pathology I see is that we don't agree on the scenarios of interest ahead of time. We tend to start with problems like, hey, let's think about the risk to control systems in, uh, in power plants or something like that. And uh, that's not a sufficiently narrow question, right? We have to think about, well, what exactly are the pieces of that contribute to that risk? And how do we agree? And do we agree on what's, what should be considered and what shouldn't be? Um, those questions are often not well agreed to, um, but you have to do that in order to scope risk analysis. Um, usually we get really overwhelmed really quickly um, and the problems are complex and getting clear descriptions of those problems is difficult. Uh, we tend to think that we don't have all the data so we can't do anything. Like I don't have good enough data to estimate certain parameters or something. Uh, when in fact, that's just not true. There's a lot that you can do just getting the logic of the problem right. and uh, using what data you have, um, if any, uh, to start and start making decisions. And really quickly, you start to understand that not everything's important all the time um, and that you can, uh, you can make good decisions and uh, good estimates of risk, even if you don't have all the data you think you need at the beginning. Um, a big problem I see is people generally try to start at the bottom of the problem and work up rather than work down. And so uh, you see people sink a lot of effort into building a really exquisite model for one component of the system rather than thinking about all the different parts of the system at the top and then making uh, good decisions about which components need to be um, actually modeled at higher fidelities and which don't. Um, and so we tend to spend, the, I tend to see, well, I can actually give you really clear examples 
of when I've seen people spend lots and lots of money building really exquisite models on something that just didn't wind up not mattering at the end. They're just not important um, if we really thought about the risk problem from the top down. And on the other side of that is we tend to spend a lot of time optimizing parts of the system that are optimizable rather than and thinking that we're optimizing the whole system by doing so. And that's just not always true. Um, lots of money goes into building better sensors when the sensor signal isn't actually, uh, you know, actionable or doesn't actually produce anything that we, any information that can lead us to make better decisions. And so building better sensors really doesn't matter, but it's something that I see a lot of research money poured into. Um, so for these reasons, we tend to be really bad at risk analysis as, um, as a society. Um, and where I want to start is like, let's just get some definitions of what I mean by risk. When people say risk, they usually mean one of a few different things colloquially. They might think about it as a possible harm scenario, right? Depending on where you live, earthquakes are a risk, right? So uh, I might live in an area where an earthquake scenario could happen, and I call that a risk. Um, we might talk about it as a general state of peril, right? Like uh, these people are at risk risk because we perceive that they're exposed to some hazardous scenario and that, that could lead to consequences, but we don't we're not really precise about what that means. Um, we could think about it as um, as sort of exposure to a particular hazard or class of hazards. It's, you know, there's a risk of collapse or a risk of fire or a risk of breach. Um, so we're saying there are specific that we think are um, that we were exposed to them in a way that matters. Or we might think of risk as a likelihood in and of itself, right? There's a significant risk of structural damage, meaning we think that there's a high likelihood something could happen. So we tend to use this word risk to mean a lot of things that are part of risk, but not actually the whole thing itself. Um, and I think it's important to think about a full definition of risk. So if we go, if we go with an academic definition of risk, something that, that explains all the parts that are necessary, we wind up with something like this, right? We think about the potential for an unwanted outcome resulting from an incident, event, or occurrence as determined by its likelihood and associated consequences. So right there, there's two things we have to think about, likelihood and consequence. And we generally break likelihood down into threat and vulnerability, right? So the, the either a natural or man-made occurrence um, is threat. It's some, something that initiates a scenario. Someone has attacked us. Someone has breached a system. There's been a fire that's been started. There's a hurricane, something that sets off the scenario that we care about. And then we think about vulnerability separately as uh, this, this likelihood that um, given that scenario starts, that there is some state of compromise we would reach because of a system failure or an exposure or something like that. And um, and that when we think about those two things together, we get a likelihood that a certain state of compromise could be reached, right? Uh, and so as we move through this problem, we now have a, we can now start generating a probability distribution over those states of compromise. And then given those states of compromise, we think about, well, then what bad could happen as a result? Right. Um, so we have consequences. That's the, the third component. So we have to think about risk as threat, vulnerability, and consequences. Usually we think about threat and vulnerability as a likelihood and a consequence as some measure of a bad. And we're now trying to demonstrate a or trying try to generate a probability distribution over uh, that set of consequences, that measure of badness. Right. And what you see happen a lot is that people will focus on portions of this problem or portions of this framing. They'll think about, uh, I think this vulnerability is there um, and uh, it's a well-known vulnerability. And so I'm gonna prioritize my risks based on how likely that vulnerability is to lead to a state of compromise. If they could do this, they could get this kind of access to our systems or something like that. And we tend to just focus on prioritizing that or consequences where people say, man, if this happened, all of these things, bad things would come from it, and we're going to prioritize based on consequences. And the problem there with doing that is that gives you a partial view of risk. And sometimes it's sufficient, but oftentimes it's not. Is that you have to think about the probability of that happening in the first place, so not assuming the threat is one. Um, you have to think about, given the threat happened, the probability that we get to a state of compromise, so not assuming that if a vulnerability, if a, if a scenario starts, it's automatically going to result in a compromise state. Um, and then given a compromise happened, what is the probability of getting to a certain magnitude of consequence, right? So we can be uncertain about consequences as well. So that's the definition that I'm going to sort of lay on the table as we go forward and say that's how we should be thinking about risk from the start. And if we're assuming away parts of the problem, then let's be conscious about how we do 
The other thing I want to point out that risk analysis is one side of a coin. Um, it's really part and parcel with decision analysis. And so if we think about risk analysis and decision analysis, we think about decision analysis as uh, a way to make optimal decisions in the face of uncertainty. So if we have, uh, uh, if we have variables that we're trying to uh, maximize, like minimizing risk, minimizing risk or maximizing value or something like that, there's lots of great ways that we deal with that on a set of principles that allow us to choose between alternatives in the face of that uncertainty. And risk analysis is a required input to that process. We have to be able to go out and characterize that uncertainty in the system and then bring that information back to inform decision analysis. And so these two things work together, but they're different, right? Decision analysis is going to have agency in the problem where risk analysis is purely there to say, given the facts and the logic, this is what we're facing. And I think oftentimes people mix those two things together a little too much and they wind up um, maybe biasing risk analysis with preferential outcomes because they are thinking they're in the decision analysis phase. You really want to keep those things separate. Uh, and oftentimes people who are doing risk analysis think they're making the decision and they're not. Um, and people who are doing decision analysis think they understand the system and they don't. Um, there's an implicit contract between these two sides. And that contract has to do with uh, decision analysis provides a frame for risk analysis to happen, right? We think about uh, questions and decision analysis being picking between being, picking these alternatives. What material should I use to build the rocket? Uh, what kind of responsive action should I employ in case of a disruption? Uh, what restrictions should be placed on foreign acquisitions of, um, of uh, information and communications technologies, right? Those are decision problems and they have consequences depending on which alternative alternatives we pick but they provide a frame in which we can do risk analysis. And the reason we need that frame is because we're gonna to have to make a lot of assumptions. We're gonna to have to make a lot of choices and judgments as analysts to get to the right information. And so the risk analysis version of those questions look like, what is the probability of rocket failure if I use this material or that material or the other material, right? Um, or uh, what ICT components is, if exploded would, or exploited would cause the most significant impact to national security or the company bottom line or something like that. So those questions are framed after generating knowledge and it informs a decision analysis. And so this cycle happens. And in fact, in, in the government, uh, within DHS, um, they, they use this cycle and lay it out and say, this is the risk management process. When I do both of those things together, I'm doing risk management. And so I have this side that where I'm producing risk analysis and I have the side where I'm consuming risk analysis. And this is important to understand what role you're playing as you do this as you do this work. Um, you know, you're going to see this side, this spiral happen where we're we're defining context, we're building a risk analysis, we're informing and developing alternatives, and then decisions get made, and then we learn some more, and then we do it again. And good risk analysis goes is is really tightly bound to the decision process. It's framed by the decision process, and it's continuous in that it's happening over time um, and iteratively as we learn more and more information. So to give a quick example, um, you know, about how this works, I did a lot of work on asteroid impacts uh, a while back, um, and, and we'll get to some cyber things here in a minute, but um, I did a lot of work on asteroid impacts. And so the first thing I had to do was define uh, how, does, how do we think about the probability of fatalities given an asteroid impact on the Earth. And we built a big model and we went through a bunch of existing paperwork uh, and, and, and writing on this um, and we're able to come up with this, this estimate. And this estimate, um, if we look at it, really gets after uh, a distribution over consequences. Consequences aren't necessarily scalar uh, there's the, or necessarily single value. Um, there's this idea that we can be uncertain about the consequences we face, even though we know that a certain thing has happened, we've had a certain bad outcome. Um, and so what we've got here is a complementary cumulative distribution function over the number of fatalities per year uh, or per century, I should say, from an asteroid impact. And so we would read this and we, you know, developing this curve was the purpose of the first pass of risk analysis that we did. Uh, before that, we were using averages in the community and saying like, all right, well, the average number of deaths per year we would expect uh, from asteroid impacts is X. And this tells a much different story than the average because it tells us the shape of this tail and how this can lead to really big bad outcomes in certain cases, uh, vice a very low average fatality rate, which sort of can be misinterpreted very easily. 
And so once we had developed that curve, we could then start looking at, uh, and that model, we could then start looking at other uh, ways of thinking about the problem. We started thinking about, well, there are certain asteroid collisions that are so cataclysmic that they would create uh, a serious threat to life on Earth. And that is generally thought of as a function of diameter because it's thought of as a function of the, um, uh, the kind of kinetic energy that's involved in the problem. And we can think about, well, what probabilities of getting different, uh, or what probabilities of finding asteroids of those diameters um, out there exist? And we have data that we can look at to, to bring us through that problem. And so by looking at this probabilistically, instead of just looking at averages, we're able to show uh, what is the risk of actually getting into a serious collision with an asteroid that would create um, consequences on Earth that could lead to uh, mass extinction events. And uh, previously, the way when we think about it from an average point of view, we would generally say things like, well, north of about a kilometer of diameter, it's a real bad day for humanity if that happens. Uh, anything less than a kilometer is locally bad, but maybe not a bad day for all of humanity. But if we look at those distributions of those inputs and take a probabilistic view, then what we start to see is that the risk actually peaks way lower than a thousand meters. That that we can start to see this uh, this distribution here as a function of the diameter changing, and that actually there's a ton of risk involved in the 300 to a thousand meter range, whereas before we weren't we were just kind of looking north of a thousand meters. And so with that information, we can go back and we can start looking at different policies for how we might do planetary defense, right? We can start thinking about, well, you know, could I, could I shoot a kinetic impactor at it? Can I um, park a gravity tractor next to it? Can I use standoff nuclear detonations? Can I use other things? And I can start to see how risk is reduced under those different policies. And then that can inform decision-making about, all right, let's go out and make investments. And so this is just to sort of show how those things come together and you sort of get this uh, view of risk uh, in a really comprehensive way by not by not making a bunch of assumptions about averages and things like that, and then how that can go and start informing the, the other side of this. Right? And so one of the keys here is to be perspective and not predictive. We don't want to be in a situation where we're betting on one value or using those averages. We want to think about all possible outcomes and then use those out the relative likelihoods of those outcomes and make decisions and strategies that account for all of those. And we do this all the time naturally. We just fail to do it a lot when we do formal risk analysis. It's a common failure mode. I mean, look at a hurricane slot, right? As a hurricane's moving through and we're estimating where it's going, we don't draw a single line. We draw a cone of uncertainty. And when we make evacuation decisions, we don't evacuate where the most likely point of landing is. We evacuate a swath of land because we don't know where it's going to land. So we're making this perspective argument naturally in that case, or like when we buy homeowner's insurance. If I was making taking the most likely case, I wouldn't buy homeowner's insurance because it's very unlikely my house will burn down. However, the consequences are such that I wanna think about that case as well and makes decisions that account for even a low likelihood of high consequence event. And oftentimes when I see risk analysis, I see this not being done. I see people taking averages and uh, most likely cases and things like that rather than being perspective. So you want to be perspective, not predictive, when we think about these things. And when we do risk analysis, there's a tremendous number of tools out there. I think one of the other things I see is that a lot of people will argue there's only one right way to do it, or one right tool to use, or this has to be probabilistic risk assessment, PRA, and uh, tree, you know, event trees and things like that, or it doesn't count. Um, and that's totally false. There's this large swath of tools that we can choose from, from very simple narrative-based tools through uh, some things that are used to think about uh, like relative risk assessments that are used to think about um, uh, co uh, conversations about what's most important and what's most likely and these sorts of things all the way through the very quantitative. Uh, and being able to pick those tools and apply them um, as needed can often lead to better results from risk analysis. One of the things I see often happening is that people will start down here at the bottom uh, and trying to build a very complicated probabilistic model and then sort of get to a point where they can't go any further because they just they get overwhelmed by the complexity. Whereas if they had started at the top with framing and scoping um, conversations, they might have gotten to an outcome pretty quickly because it's very clear once you talk about what matters, whether or not certain actions should be taken, whether, whether the probabilistic analysis happens or not. So oftentimes I see people being satisfied with risk analysis, even if it's still in a narrative form. 
And so there's a ton of value in doing those steps because they allow you to do the later steps better. They give you all the information and framing you need to be able to do the more sophisticated stuff if you need to, but they also prevent you from going too far with those things when it's not worthwhile to do them in a lot of cases that I see. And there are great examples of all of these things out there. I'm going to show a couple really quickly, and then I want to get into why I think risk analysis, why doing all of this in cyber context is hard and what we're trying to do about that. So um, a lot of times when we think about the spectrum, we think about on the on one end, we've got more qualitative methods, and on one end, we've got more quantitative methods. Um, generally, people tend to want to start on the left here if they're doing this principally in a principled way and move to the right as necessary. So you kind of bring in more quantitative tools uh, or more sophisticated tools as necessary rather than thinking that you've got to do um, everything probabilistically at the beginning. So good examples of framing and scoping tools are just building scenarios, um, going through and doing scenarios, coming up with a, um, a list of scenarios that we all agree on. Uh, can be tremendously helpful. Um, what we, in a lot of the work that we do with the government, this is probably one of the biggest steps that we can take. Um, if we all agree on what scenarios we're going to be analyzing um, and we start talking through them, we can pretty quickly sort those out based on what our current state of knowledge is and start saying, okay, these are the ones we really have to think about. These are the ones we're less worried about. Uh, and we get focused very quickly. Um, there's uh, you know, being able to sort of say what could happen, whether it's likely or not, um, has a lot of value, uh, believe it or not. And there's lots of work that has been done at the federal level, both in what is in the chemical context, um, in the bio context, in the cyber context, where just getting to these scenario narratives and making some broad the, uh, comparative statements has really uh, provided a lot of insight that um, doing that in an organized way uh, has has helped where not where. where without those things, there's been a really disorganized kind of chaos going on. So I've seen problems be solved just from doing this, uh, where people have enough to make decisions after the step. There's a really, there's really great examples where relative risk assessments happen, where we start to make um, uh, uh, arguments about likelihood and, and consequences. We start to think about classes of scenarios and how those are more or less likely. There's lots of risk register work going on where people are setting all those scenarios from the framing and scoping exercises and then putting in their best assessments and having conversations with experts and trying to get to the point where they've got some initial ranking so they can prioritize their efforts. Um, doing this allows you to really remove some biases that we have when we conflate things like consequences and likelihood together. Um, and it allows us to create this initial prioritization that um, is really helpful. And it's usually done in this sort of group based way uh, where you have a lot of buy in about the next step. And so the soft, these softer parts of risk analysis are often overlooked when we sort of dive in, um, but they're really, really important in getting this right. And here again, I've seen lots of examples where this was enough, right? We didn't need to go into those really deep models because this was enough to get after it. And I think in really complicated spaces, doing this can help us sort out and focus what we're we're trying to go after. You'll see this a lot um, in, in government, uh, especially in government, but also a lot in industry where people will start to put together uh, scoring and ranking systems where they're starting to think, bring data in and they're starting to think about likelihoods and impacts in a more quantitative way, but starting to think sort of uh, in bins, right? This is really likely, meaning the probability is between X and Y or not so likely, meaning it's between this other interval um, we get, maybe that's coming from data, maybe that's coming from interviewing experts. Um, it allows us to start putting in some of the properties that allow us to do probabilistic risk assessment, like being really clear about the bins and making sure they're mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, that we've got some ordered set of thinking about how bad something is rather than just real bad. What, like what factors are we using to think about that? We're starting to build the structure here that allows us to move on to more formal risk assessments with, uh, with, with data and, um, and quantitative methods. And again, a lot of times this is where problems will stop. You know, you will put this together in an initial uh, an assessment using these sorts of methods and people will go, got it, I know what I need now and I can make my decision and move on. Um, you'll see diagrams that look like this a lot where we're starting to think about scoring on scenario likelihood and, sc and scenario consequences and then making arguments about what's high risk and what's low risk. 
And these have to do with our values and what we think is a bad outcome or a good outcome. Um, the trick here is to have really consistent logic. And so we set up these diagrams where we answer specific questions about scenarios and then tier them out into different levels of consequence or likelihood. Uh, and this creates a defensibility argument because now people can say, how did you arrive at that conclusion? This is high risk. Well, it fits these factors. It gets us to this outcome. Um, and therefore we score it that way. Uh, and then if there's arguments about the scoring, we can have arguments about the factors instead of the outcome. Um, this is a very powerful thing that seems really simple. And if you're really into formal risk analysis, then you look at this and go, yeah, this is a little bit, uh, you know, soft. Um, but at the same time, this is where probably 80% of the work is in terms of the things that are going on, on out there that are shaping big decisions is doing work like this. And it's, it's very important to get through that um, in order to get into the formal methods that use, um, uh, use uh, or the more formal and quantitative methods that use uh, probabilistic assessments. And so I can't underscore how important this stuff is and we can't just dive right into the quantitative stuff. And speaking of that, um, it's important to think about the differences between quantitative analysis and quali qualitative analysis um, and quantitative data and qualitative data. Um, there's lots of room in risk analysis for all of these components to work. Um, and I, I think that there's sort of a misconception that unless you're doing super quantitative, heavily data-driven analysis, it's not risk analysis that matters. Um, and you've heard me say this a couple of times through the talk so far, that's just not true. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of value from doing qualitative assessments, narrative-based assessments, doing basic scoring and ranking, getting experts in the same room, talking about the scenarios and framing up the kinds of questions that need to be answered next. Um, and quite often uh, you find yourself uh, getting most of the way through the problem with just those steps. Um, and, uh, and then you can focus your quantitative assessments on, uh, on data that you need, that you need to go get, um, or on uh, very specific problems uh, that are well scoped and, and solvable at this, at this point. So, so managing those data gaps and, uh, and understanding those data gaps from starting on the qualitative side and working your way in uh, is way, way more effective than starting with quantitative models and then trying to build the scope out so that you cover everything you care about. So those, that's sort of uh, um, my quick front to back on why we need to think about risk analysis fairly holistically and formal methods include the qualitative end of the, the spectrum. Uh, and I think that's especially true in, in the cyber and critical infrastructure space. That's been my experience that most of the work that's been really effective has been on this end so far. But that doesn't mean that quantitative methods aren't helpful. They're just really difficult. And they're difficult for a few reasons. I want to switch gears and go through that and then wrap up and then take questions. So I have sort of this, I asked this question, what makes cyber risks hard? Why is it hard to do risk analysis on cyber systems? And the first reason I'll give is legibility. That systems are fundamentally illegible um, in a lot of ways in, at levels that we need to think about for, um, for risk analysis. And so if I think about uh, you know, my risk analysis diagram here, I've got threat, vulnerability, and consequence. Um, the, finding the probabilities that vulnerabilities will be exploited by threats or vulnerabilities will pop up because of events um, is really difficult to do. Uh, and the fact that, and getting the probabilities that those vulnerabilities would lead to states of compromise in a system, I have to have a really good description of that system in order to be able to do that. And I may be able to characterize components of systems really well, but I have this very dynamic and heavily interconnected space, state space, that uh, is hard to characterize at a level where I can do that consistently. And so a lot of times we have incomplete descriptions of systems. Um, the connections aren't fully characterized. We don't have a good sense of dependencies. And so building this vulnerability portion of the, the probabilistic analysis is really hard. I think a lot of things, a lot of times data um, that describes those system topologies is dynamic, it's changing. People are upgrading systems all the time. The system state is changing, things are failing, they're replacing stuff. Um, and a lot of times, even if they had all of that data and it was accurate, it would be obsolete the minute we started using it. And so we really have to think hard about how much, to, how specific do we need it to be in order to do something useful. And I think we assume it has to be super specific to do something useful, whereas that might not always be true. Um, 
And then lastly, there's a lot of reasons why they don't, why companies that own systems don't want to share that data with others from security reasons to legal reasons to liability reasons. There's, there's, it's hard to get this data. So even if it did exist, it'd be out of date. Even if it wasn't out of date, it'd be really hard to get. So we, this is one of the things that makes this really hard for us is that being able to have legible systems um, is, uh, is, is a real, is, is a real difficulty for us. Um, the other thing is that, that con we don't have good models for consequence, right? So consequences from systems being compromised, uh, they can cascade really quickly to other systems. We don't know exactly what happens when certain functions are brought down. Um, and so we have to step back and think about this at a much higher level. And I'll talk about some of the ways we do this. Another thing that makes cyber risk hard is antagonism. Um, there's a lot that goes into thinking about adversaries. Um, and we have to think about, are we talking about group behaviors? which are generally easier to talk about statistically, um, or are we talking about behaviors of individuals which are very difficult to talk about um, from a probabilistic sense? It's not impossible, it's just hard. And those are two very different frames for thinking about risk. The reason that's important for thinking about both of those um, is that describes the front end of our whole problem, right? What is the probability that uh, an antagonist threat will be realized, that they'll take a certain action? We, we literally want to know the probability that adversaries take certain actions in order to understand what vulnerabilities might be exploited so we can get through what compromised states might be realized and how that leads to consequences, even if we're uncertain about those consequences. And so there's different ways of thinking about it. We could do normative versus descriptive. Uh, that's like game theoretic and solving for and solving their optimization problem and assuming that's what they're doing versus looking at data about behaviors or actions and saying that's a good enough description. We can think about intelligent and adaptive adversaries versus random actors. Um, and generally, we just have really large epistemic uncertainties about how people behave and what they're going to do. And so one of the things that I often see is people will say, oh, I'm, I'm not using an adversary model because I'm only looking at, I'm going to prioritize on vulnerability and consequence alone. I'm not going to, I'm just going to assume the thing is going to happen, assume the threat will happen. That may or may not be a good assumption, but you still are using an adversary model. The adversary model is just assuming the attack will always happen. That's a really basic assumption about an adversary. Again, might be appropriate in some cases, but I've never seen somebody give an explanation for their adversary model or something they're using to replace an adversary model that I can't quickly turn into a set of assumptions about an adversary that you're making implicitly in order to do this job. So you're constantly going to have an adversary model whether you admit it or not, um, and you're going to have, uh, we'll be able to turn that into assumptions that you're making about the adversary, um, and you got to just be comfortable with the assumptions. There's no good adversary models. There's a lot of bad ones, and you just have to sort of think about what assumptions are you comfortable in making. Uh, the other thing that makes cyber risk hard is scale. So um, if we think about all the different systems that are reliant on information, on control signals, on communication, um, it's everything, right? It's, it's pervasive and it's, it's the whole world. And so try, and it's very interconnected. And so trying to do things at scale is really hard. The way that we typically think about this in the critical infrastructure arena is we think about three different views of the problem. One is the, the who part, right? There are people who manage these systems and we got to think about um, uh, their roles as entities in this problem. Um, and we have to work with them to reduce risks. Um, there's an asset-centric asset view, which is the, the how or, or, or the, you know, what is the thing that's been implemented? I have this server, I have these you know, communication nodes, I have these satellite systems, I have these transatlantic cables. Um, and so thinking about it from an asset point of view is important because I gotta know what I've gotta go out and protect. The thing that allows us to make headway on the risk problem, given the scale, is to think about a third view, this functional view of what. What is that thing doing? Right? And even if I don't know exactly how the assets are interconnected, I can tell if this function that these assets enable was, uh, was compromised, then I can think about other functions that depend on that function and how those might be compromised. And so I can sort of raise above a level of the assets where I don't have good legibility and start thinking about the functional dependencies and making good headway on terms of estimating consequences of failure. But if I can track those functions down to assets at that point, I can make the argument that if this asset is compromised, I lose this function and therefore I start losing the connections. I start losing the dependent functions as well. And so that's one of the ways we get over the scale problem. Um, we start, that should sound a lot like just graph theory, right? I mean, this is 
this is exactly what we're trying to do is set up large graphs that connect functions um, and think about the different transactions and logical relationships between those functions so that we can draw that graph and start understanding those cascading pathways at the functional level without needing to understand perfectly the assets below them. And this is okay because we're operating at sort of this nationwide national scale level rather than a specific set of uh, entities or assets. And so putting those things together and developing all the different ways that we can analyze that, are we using centrality-based methods? Are we using path analysis? Are we looking at uh, you know, greatest common connected structures, substructures, things like that? There's lots of tools in the graph analysis toolbox that can allow us to do risk analysis at this level. Uh, and so, so getting into that um, is, or going in those directions is how we're handling the scale problem. One of the things I think that's going to be important is an old concept that wasn't used as much as I think it should have been in risk analysis, um, which are matrix formalizations of risk. So being able to approximate and um, abstract out scenarios into elements that we can use to characterize sort of transition probabilities between state spaces and looking at um, a threat hazard matrix, uh, a vulnerability matrix that describes our system and moving between the different states. Uh, and consequence matrices in order to estimate risk from very large classes of scenarios um, is one of those things that I think um, we're going to have to do. Now, that means we're going to have to think about big approximations, but at some scale, um, we're going to have to do that anyway. And it's this, these sorts of methods can allow us to sort of take a step back and, and start to understand and rapidly calculate risk under different circumstances. It also allows us to, under certain assumptions, um, make components of this risk uh, of this risk equation more separable. So uh, we can search for high consequence pinch points, which are the state spaces that exist between these matrices versus trying to think from front to back on every single scenario, um, which can lead to some really interesting conclusions about where we might be prioritizing our mitigation efforts. Um, so I think there's a lot of hope in doing, doing some of this level of mathematics when it comes to calculating risk, even though we're giving up kind of in, full scenario endpoint to endpoint conditionality, right? We're sort of assuming independence and, and Markovian properties where they may not exist, but we have to do that in order to battle scale. And that opens us up to being able to do this kind of math. So uh, just have some closing thoughts here. Uh, I think that people think about risk analysis often as sort of a checkbox where I have to do a risk analysis, all right, did these things happen, yes or no? Yes, I've done my risk analysis, we're okay. Um, it's so much more than that. It's an integrating approach for a lot of different disciplines that we have to bring to bear, specifically on problems like, like uh, cyber threats where we have these huge challenges like legibility, antagonism, and scale um, that make this hard. It's an integrating approach. It brings all of this information together to inform decisions. And so we've got to understand this at the policy and strategy level, at the design level, and at the fundamental research and development level. Um, risk analysis has a role to play at every level. And if I'm sort of broadening more out and sort of being an advocate for risk management analysis, it's a growing capability. There's a huge field of people that do this. It's a discipline um, in the sense that we're really leveraging um, an academic base that has been putting a lot of effort over the last several decades into how you do this thing right. Um, uh, and there's a lot of hard won best practices out there um, and, and theories that, that need to be understood more broadly. Uh, risk itself is a budget, just like you have a money budget in terms of how you build a system, you have a risk budget. Um, and I think, you know, we have to get over sort of antiquated concepts like we always have to minimize all risk out of the system. That's just not feasible. We have to be accepting a certain amount of risk. And the question isn't, do we have to accept risk? The question is, where do we accept risk? Where do we spend our risk budget? Um, that's a different mental model, I think, for a lot of people than more sort of like we have to eliminate risk. Um, systems, we just can't do that uh, in, in a lot of the, the systems that we, we care about. We can't afford to do that. So we, starting with these simple high-level models and working our way down and thinking about where do I allocate risk and where do I make decisions to accept risk is a much more productive way of getting through these things. And it's a full-time, full-contact sport. Um, I spend a lot of time in working with decision makers at fairly high levels in federal agencies, um, trying to understand what they think the concerns are, trying to help them understand concerns that they should have but don't have yet, 
um, and then um, working with people who are designing and analyzing systems to sort of bring all this data together in a way that's informative. And good risk analysis creates insights for at all those levels and really drives and focuses conversations and decisions. And you can't do that sort of with a light touch. You have to be part of the organization and part of the system uh, in order to do that. So um, if you do risk analysis right, you're doing it pretty intimately and all the time with the organizations you're trying to work with and help. Okay, I uh, think I'm on time for some questions. Um, I'm happy to take any that you have. And you know, sorry for this being kind of high level, I wanted to focus on what is formal risk analysis and what are ways that that becomes challenging uh, in, a, in a cyber context with a very top down view. So I hope I accomplished it. Questions or comments? I don't know if there's a chat. Can you talk a little bit more about um, what makes risk analysis and cyber special from other types of risk analysis? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I point out the three areas where I think it, it is difficult. Um, and I'm, those are pretty broad buckets. I mean, so maybe what I can do is unpack those buckets a little bit more. Um, I think the legibility argument um, is one where it's more difficult because, like I said, we don't understand, we don't have good descriptions of systems that are static, uh, they change quickly. I think also there's dependencies there that aren't quite realized or well articulated. And so, uh, it makes coming up with estimates of risk really difficult because there's lots of things that can confound that calculation. I think it's, I think it's, there's been kind of a view uh, that we, sh that this is not a tractable problem uh, given the scale and complexity of it. Um, and I think that, that, that what's been ha what you know I think what I've heard from a lot of folks and what I've seen happen is people sort of throw up their hands and go this is just too hard and so we're just going to make priorities decisions on prioritizing prioritizing mitigation options on other factors rather than risk and I think that's losing a lot um, and I think a lot of that comes from misconceptions about how risk analysis works which is why I start this talk with here's what risk analysis is so when we think about cyber systems getting after that legibility thing. Um, and then acknowledging that we can't always be perfectly legible, so we're going to have to come up with ways of thinking about things a little more abstractly, um, and that there's a lot of utility in doing that. Um, not all, I think that's especially true in cyber systems as compared to other systems, right? So useful abstractions are way more important here than they are in a lot of other systems where we have highly legible systems that we can characterize and model. Um, climate change is similar, right? Climate change, uh, there's a lot of epistemic uncertainty in how things work. Uh, and so we have to make big abstractions in order to do useful things in risk analysis, but it's still very useful to do. So those really highly complex, epistemically uncertain problems, um, I think cyber is in that class. Uh, and that, that's one of the things that makes it special. Um, I think here you also have, I talked about antagonism, you have that, uh, that mix of both, you know, there are just probabilistic failures of systems, systems just fail sometimes. Um, but there's a heavy antagonistic point. And that antagonistic point, unlike other security problems, where we really were like in nuclear, we worry about other nuclear armed states, where, which are exquisite actors compared to a crowd. Here, we're worrying about a crowd of uh, folks that are doing things to systems that are nuisances, but highly consequential. And we're also worried about exquisite actors. And so suddenly we're worried about the, both sides of this point instead of just one, right? Um, in terms of what creates risk and consequences. So I think this is another point where cyber is different. Um, and uh, I think we don't have, like I, one thing I'm a little frustrated with is descriptions of cyber actors that I've seen used in risk analysis tend to be very like focused on specific kind of TTPs and things like that, which can be useful, but I don't think it's complete. Um, and so, so I think there's a lot of work to do to get better descriptions of antagonists in, in cyber. Um, and then lastly, I talked about scale. Um, 
I think this is one this is one thing that really sets cyber apart from uh, risk analysis apart from other systems is that I mean it's just in everything, and um, there are dependencies and tendrils of connections that go out into things that I mean let alone our failure to understand how all of those things work. Um, we have a failure of imagination in our ability to see how those, these things are just in everything all the time. And it's difficult to keep that in mind as you're analyzing systems because we tend to be very reductive and we want to look at a very narrow thing. Um, but there's lots of different ways that these this scale kills you, right? right? One of them is, like I said, just the cascading problem of if this goes down, then this goes down, then this goes down, then this goes down. But then there's also the class problem where if there's a vulnerability like X in this system, these other systems use similar components and also have that vulnerability. And so now there's a dependency in that direction as well. So it can't, it's not just cascading through highly connected systems. It's also the idea that very disparate systems may use very similar information architectures and components um, and, com and a risk of vulnerability in one can create, is, is also a vulnerability in a completely, un, a completely different system. So now we're sort of like, everything matters all the time and it's difficult to think about. So that's why we take this functional view and step back a little bit because we just can't operate at that, uh, that asset level when it comes to those vulnerabilities. Hopefully that speaks to your, your question. Other questions or comments? Oh, <laughs> Cyrus is keeping something up. Yeah, I, I can just unmute. Um... In in the the balance between qualitative and quantitative output, um, hmm. oftentimes decision makers may lean one way or the other, but and of course a lot of times there's there's probably a bare minimum of information that they need to be able to make their decisions. But uh, in your sense, is that oftentimes more qualitative or quantitative in nature? Um, I think it's. As much as I am a fan of quantitative analysis and spend most of my time doing it, I think that the if we're talking about a threshold of sufficiency for a decision maker to move on, it's usually you get there with qualitative analysis way quicker. Um, and people will cry foul and say, well, well, you don't know this with precision. You haven't estimated this with a real narrow error bar band. That's just not how a lot of decisions are made. And so the reality that we find ourselves in quite often is that um, the decisions that matter are going to be made anyway, whether we're giving them good information or not. And rather than get to a perfect representation of our system, getting to something that provides some additional insight is incredibly valuable. Incremental improvement in our ability to understand this stuff is incredibly valuable. And I think that there's sort of a, a little bit of an illness in the risk analysis community that if I can't tell you this with absolute certainty or perfection, then um, I'm not willing to tell you because I'm worried I'm wrong. Um, unfortunately, none of that matters when the decision's made. When the decision's made, like, oh, we're going to implement a new policy, we're going to put a new regulation in place, we're going to uh, disallow certain kinds of components, we're going to invest in certain kinds of protections. Those decisions are going to be made, whether they have good risk information or not. And so I really focus on how do I get them better information rather than perfect information. Um, and a lot of times that better information comes through really good qualitative analysis that can at least sort of sort out portions of the problem of what's important and what's not. So that may sound really fluffy and may sound really like, uh, geez, Jason, you're sort of stepping away from the formalism you're kind of talking about. My argument is those are formal methods and they, even though they're qualitative and narrative focused or just get to good uh, organized descriptions of how things could fail, Oftentimes, those are the things that actually drive decisions um, because the perfect quantitative answer is either unobtainable, will take too long, or uh, is, has, is way beyond the threshold of what matters in making that decision. So I, I try to take a really formal but pragmatic view about how decisions are made and what would be helpful information versus perfect information. Does that help, Cyrus? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm wondering about the following. Um, adaptive element. If the adversary gains access to your risk analysis and decision analysis, then the adversary could adaptively change their strategies and actions. Um, what comments do you have about that? And what recommendations do you have about dealing with that threat? 
yeah, there's a, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, the, uh, I, let's see. If you're if, if you're making that assumption, like if you're doing a risk analysis and assuming that they have access to the risk analysis itself when your adversary makes decisions, uh, one one might call that an insider threat, um, and that's assuming a really informed adversary. Uh, and if there are situations where that's a reasonable assumption, uh, but that's a specific adversary model, then that we would that you would have to consider. Um, and so um, I think. More realistically, adversaries don't have that level of knowledge of most systems. I think it's mo most likely that the case. Um, but it brings up a really interesting question about are there risks to doing risk analysis, right? So if I'm aggregating a bunch of information to characterize a system so I can do risk analysis on that system, I am creating new knowledge in a couple of ways. One way is I'm putting all that in one place. And now, how is that information protected? And what if that's breached and lost? And I have a compromise of confidentiality there. Um, the other is that I'm also giving them everything they need to pick exactly the right attack, right? Um, I have seen very little work on that in terms of how does one formally model it and think through it. Um, I have proposed that kind of work in the past. Uh, you know, like what the the what is it the, the risk of knowing, right, or something like that. I had a proposal a long time ago that. That looked at that, but I think that's something that's understudied, quite frankly. So, um, and it's unclear to me if you are uh, thinking about that as a, um, uh, if you should just be thinking about that as like an exquisite insider threat. Well, thank you. Or not. Yeah, the exquisite risk analyst. That's not a very satisfactory answer to your question, I know, but it's one of those areas that I've thought about, but I don't think has been studied enough. Um, and the risk you create when you aggregate this knowledge is probably real, but I don't see many people thinking about it. So, other comments or questions? Yeah, I sort of had a thought, especially when you look at sort of an asset-based view of this stuff. Can you think of another field where you might be defending assets you're not aware of the way you do in computer science? Like some years ago, we studied the phenomenon of shadow IT, for example. Mm. So, so it seems like sometimes you might be assessing the risk to systems that you may not be aware of, I suppose. Mm. Um, you may not have like complete descriptions of? Yeah, you, you might not be aware at all that, for instance, one of the, you know, organizations that you're assessing the risk for is even using cyber in a certain way, like maybe they have like IOT devices, you're not aware of or stuff like that. It seems like it would add a lot of complexity. Like, um, can you think of another field where that's a thing or is that like specific to computing? I don't think it's specific to computing unless I'm misunderstanding. I think that's, I would maybe controversially say that I think that's true in any system. Um, is that we're always sort of balancing a level of epistemic uncertainty about our description of the system. Um, there could be, so let's take, for example, uh, let's take, for example, the water, the power infrastructure in the United States. Um, now that's, you're gonna, that's a little bit of a cheat because it's very closely related to the communications infrastructure, but um, I think there's a lot of difference between the as-built real like instantiated power grid and how we understand it. Um, and I think we have to make assessments of uh, risk to that power grid, not quite knowing exactly how everything's connected. I mean, there are places where we don't know, you know, exactly where that line is buried, or we don't know exactly what's connected on the other end. Um, the power company doesn't know exactly what I'm plugging in here at the house or these sorts of things. It's probably way more legible than in computing. But there are certainly uncertainties around the model itself that we have because we don't have perfect information about how it's actually built right this second. So I, my argument is that at least at least at some level, there's epistemic uncertainty about the nature of the system in any case. And, and we're always trying to manage risk, understanding that there are things we don't know about the system we're trying to describe. Um, if I think about a proliferation argument, um, I may have uncertainty about a level of weaponization that a country has been able to achieve, 
And so I don't, I'm trying to manage risk there and I don't quite know exactly what they've done or what capabilities they have or anything like that. Um, and so they may have weapons already, I don't know, right? They may have certain kinds of weapons already, I don't know. Um, but I have to account for that. And I think this is, goes back to my argument about being perspective versus predictive is a perspective argument would try and allow for different cases and then do an aggregate risk assessment over all of them. I think, so, so my bottom line is I think that epistemic uncertainty about system descriptions, which is how I would think about your question, is true all the time, but to different degrees. The thing about cyber systems or computing systems is I think it's significantly more than most other systems we care about. So there's, there's significantly more epistemic uncertainty. This is my argument about legibility, right? Is there's significantly more uncertainty in these cases than I think in other spaces. But I can, I can rapidly think of places where I have uncertainty about what's in the system, but I'm still doing risk assessment on it, like the power grid or the water infrastructure, or, uh, or even like human systems. That, you know, if we're trying to think about risk to in in the, uh, like uh, disinformation and social media and things like that. There's a lot of epistemic uncertainty about how that works and what's connected and who knows what but we still have to think about that system as a whole. Okay, yeah, that, that's fairly convincing. Um, I think the example you gave is very good, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, it's, I was, it's probably also fairly unsatisfactory, <laughs> but a lot, a lot of answers in risk analysis are, so I apologize if that's the case. Well, it's interesting, the problem, th this problem, I feel like we encountered this in you know, formal verification of protocols as well, just because it's not clear if the thing you've modeled is equivalent to the thing that's out there, right? Right. Um, that, that's sort of a question that haunts my mind a lot. And I guess what I, I guess maybe a satisfactory thing would be is, is there can, can you think of something we can do to improve the situation, however slight? Because uh, it seems to be a problem in general that we specify something, somebody builds it, and then the question is, did the thing they build actually correspond to that specification or not, right? Yeah. Um, the, the only good answer I have to that, and it may not be a great one, is I think abstractions matter, right? And so in this work uh, that I'm sort of alluding to, there's a whole like set of lectures and you know, Cyrus has been who invited me to the talk, thank you, Cyrus, um, has been fairly instrumental in implementing a lot of this at the federal level, um, is abstracting away from the assets as built and thinking more about the functions as executed, right? And so this idea of thinking functionally about the system means that like I'm, I'm losing, leg I'm, I'm giving up legibility for the idea of being able to think about how the system operates. And now we have, the, the thing we have to deal with is what are the probabilities that the system would operate in the way I think it's going to operate, or are there other behaviors I'm concerned with, and how do I think that, um, uh, how do I think those balance, right? And are there hidden behaviors or shadow behaviors, if I'm going to use the language that's been used so far, that I need to be considering? Um, so I think abstractions like this can help, especially in really complex and illegible systems, uh, because it allows us to focus on behaviors and dependent behaviors rather than getting bogged down in specific builds of, of um, of assets. So that's, again, not a panacea at all, right? Uh, but I think it's helpful in that it gets us down the road with thinking about where we need to make certain interventions uh, and understanding the impacts of those interventions in a better way. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Last, last, last minute questions before the end of time here. Ryan has something in the chat. I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, Ryan, do you want to unmute and talk about it or I, I can interpret it? Oh, Washington, the stake of speed or money because the benefit of doing things right is intangible. Oh, it's a parallel. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is one of the big drivers that has created a lot of risk in uh, is, is sort of like the economic versus risk reduction argument, right? There's really economic and feature benefits that have been driving how things are built in a way that moves us away from abilities to understand the systems well enough to do, you know, risk assessment the way we'd like. Um, and so we see that trade off bearing out um, if you're talking about like people cutting corners or doing things for for speed or money expediency 
uh, rather than for like risk reduction reasons. Um, yeah, that's prevalent all over the place. And I think that's one of the reasons that this is such a hard thing to do right now. Um, so yeah, it's a parallel to, I think the, the conversation we just had, but I think there's also an argument there about like why risk is a budget because you have to trade it off with things like money and speed and efficacy um, rather than just say I'm going to reduce all risk because I have to. Uh, so just that's the, those are sort of my random voltage thoughts that come after that after that comment, right? It's a good one. Well, thank you very much, Jason. We appreciate it. Um, and we'll be Great. back in two weeks when Austin Murdoch. We'll talk about the company he created in Maryland for cybersecurity after receiving his PhD from Berkeley. He's a UMBC graduate. Awesome. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Well.